Okay, so we're back and we're going to move on to explaining anxiety disorders through natural selection. Um, the idea that perhaps some of our anxiety might be beneficial and may have benefited our ancestors in the past has actually just very recently gotten some really good support um, just not a day ago, as I'm, as I'm giving this lecture right now, a big study was released that showed that uh, tendencies, particularly towards phobias, may be passed down as a protective mechanism, and that those of us who have fears of things, um, that are anxious about things, are the descendants of those ancestors who had the good sense to stay away from scary things. Um, that's what the idea is with natural selection that those of us who have fears or anxieties may have a better chance of reproducing and getting our genes into the future. Now, let's look at some of our common phobic objects. Snakes. That's scary, right? Uh, more people are, uh, as you recall from my earlier lecture, more people are scared of snakes um, than um, a lot of other things. Um, high places. I use the Seattle Space Needle since that's a local thing to where I live. Um, but people are scared of heights. People are scared of closed spaces, you know, being shoved in a closet or something like that. Um, people are scared of the dark. These are really common phobic objects. Now, if you th compare them to things that are kind of similar, but most people don't have phobias about, you start to realize it's not anything about the way the object necessarily looks, right? Because a fish has scales just like a snake does. Um, a fish doesn't walk around on feet, it squirms to get around. Um, it can bite, most fish aren't venomous, but I mean it can bite, and see that most fish aren't venomous. Maybe we're scared of snakes and not fish, because more snakes are venomous than fish are, right? Snakes are, de are dangerous to us. And I'd like to also point out that fish don't usually like crawl into your bedroll while you're outside, right? And then you come back into your sleeping area, put your feet into your bedroll, and aha, hello, somebody who's trying to find a warm place to cuddle up, right? Fish don't usually do that. So snakes have some inherent qualities about them that make them scarier and more dangerous to us. Um, here's another angle on the space needle. People don't tend to be as scared, <laughs> afraid, or alternatively scared of low places, although ironically sometimes people get creeped out when looking up at something high, which is kind of what this picture is de depicting. I was trying to depict something low. People don't tend to be scared of low, low places, um, which would just be the direct opposite of high places. It should have the same characteristics as a high place, but the thing is you don't have that fear of falling off of a low place, and so it loses its inherent scariness. Um, people tend not to be scared of wide open spaces, even though you could get lost in this scenery, and you could be wandering around and die of exposure, but people are rarely scared of wide open spaces. A lot of people are scared of closed places, and most people aren't scared of light, although there are some people who are photophobic. Um, most people are not. Most people who are scared of something having to do with light or dark will be scared of dark, and why is that? Because stuff comes out after dark right? Suddenly there are creatures that creep around. Bad guys skulk around under the cover of darkness, right? there. And then, of course, we have all of our um, stories that tell us that to be scared of the dark, even if you didn't think of it on your own, you know, our, our um, fairy tales and things tell us to be scared of the dark. So if you look under the category of phobic objects, you could say there's really nothing different, really that much different about the, the things that are in the phobic column versus the non-phobic, except for that historically the things in the phobic column have been dangerous to humans. And so possibly those of us who have the good sense to be scared of them are the ones who, you know, are most likely to get our genes into the future. Now where we start to break off, and I talked about this in my earlier lectures on biology, is that it's fine to be scared of heights and to have a good, you know, you wouldn't want to go to the top of the Space Needle and just sort of stand there with nothing to support you and no railing around it and the wind could blow you off. All right, nobody really, most people don't really want to do that. There are people who like it and want to jump off of it, but most of us have the good sense not to put ourselves in jeopardy in a high place. But most of us aren't phobic 
of a high place where we literally will go into a panic attack or um, we will change our lifestyle to avoid having to go to a high place. There are people who have to change where they live because all the jobs in their field in that city are skyscra skyscraper jobs and they're scared to, to go up into a skyscraper. That's a, that's a phobia. That's changing your life to avoid your fear object. Most of us are not at that level. Most of us just have um, a natural fear of, of some of these objects. Some of us get over that fear and then, you know, welcome these objects. Um, but for most of us, our level of fear is adaptive. The phobic level is, is taking that too far and it becomes maladaptive. Okay, well enough on anxiety. Actually, let's talk about anxiety's brother, which is depression. And um, I'm going to talk about major depressive disorder rather than, you know, maybe just feeling um, blue or something like that. I'm going to talk about major depressive disorder. Okay, to be diagnosed with major depression, you're going to have a depressed mood for most of us. But this is not a guarantee. I'm going to give you a list of some symptoms and you have to have at least five of these lasting for at least two weeks. So you may have a depressed mood. You may have a dimin diminished interest or pleasure in activities that you used to like. So something that you used to enjoy doing, your friends say, hey, you want to go do that thing? And you're sitting like, oh, I, just, I, don't, I don't really want to. Um, that's, that, and, and it's a change for you. I mean, a lot of us are not interested in certain things, but that doesn't make us depressed. <laughs> but if you used to like it, and now you just aren't that interested in doing it or you don't find it to be that fun anymore, it could be because you're suffering from a depression. So you have to have at least one of these two, either a depressed mood or a diminished interest or pleasure, and then at least three of the next, the rest on the list. So a change in appetite or weight. And the key thing here is the change because if uh, some people become depressed and they start eating more. Some people dep become depressed and they start eating less. The key thing for an individual is to notice that it's a change for them. So if they suddenly start gaining or losing weight, that's a good way to tell that maybe their appetite has changed. A change in sleep patterns. Again, the key is the change because for some people when they're depressed, they sleep more and for some people when they're depressed, they sleep less. So the key is there's a change. Physical agitation. So the person feels rest restless. They feel edgy. They feel like they could um, become angry pretty easily. Fatigue or lethargy. So you feel just overwhelmingly tired or you just can't get yourself started. Um, your body may even literally feel heavier than usual because you're just like, oh, I just can't get moving. Um, a feeling of worthlessness or a feeling an overriding sense of guilt. And again, to be disordered, there's nothing specific that you're feeling guilty about. It's just sort of like this generalized guilt. Um, if somebody says, well, what do you have to feel guilty about? A, a depressed person will say, I don't know. I, nothing, I guess. They, they'll acknowledge that, they're, that their feeling is probably not based in reality, but they still feel it. They have problems thinking, concentrating, making decisions. And then finally, recurring thoughts of death and suicide. Okay, so you only need to have three of the ones in black font and you need to have at least one of the first two listed in order to be diagnosed as suffering from major depression. Okay, and then the symptoms need to last at least two weeks. Okay, the other mood disorder that I wanted to talk about is bipolar. When I was a student, it was called manic depression, but now we call it bipolar disorder. And in this one, we're going to have the depressed symptoms that I just got done listing. You're going to have your depressed phase and then it's going to alternate with periods of mania. And with mania, you're going to have giddy, euphoric, irritable, kind of upbeat, but not truly happy kind of um, mood. And you have to have that symptom. That's the one symptom that must be present for you to be diagnosed with mania. And then you have to have at least three of the following. Exaggerated optimism, where you think that anything is possible, hypersociality and sexuality. So you may have a person who suddenly is going to all sorts of parties, has all these new friends, is busy all the time socializing. Um, maybe you've got a person who is suddenly very um, uh, indiscriminate in their sexual contacts. They aren't, they aren't really worried about consequences. Pretty much everybody's valid partner during the manic phase. 
they take delight in everything. Everything is the greatest. Everything is the most awesome. Oh, I love you guys so much. Oh, I love this. This is my favorite. Oh, this is the greatest. Oh, isn't this fun? About everything. There's no just neutral. Nothing's neutral. Everything is delightful. Impulsivity and overactivity. The impulsivity can be tied back to the hypersexuality, um, but impulsivity, you're doing things without necessarily thinking about the consequences. And then overactivity, you're just busy all the time. You're just jiggling your foot if you're supposed to be sitting still, which a lot of us do. Don't diagnose yourself with one, <laughs> based on one symptom. <laughs> a lot of us jiggle our feet. Um, but overactivity, you're jiggling your feet when you can't be doing what you really want to do, which is running around, cleaning the house, picking up, doing this, always something moving, doing something all the time. Overactivity. Um, racing thoughts, where it ha you have a hard time figuring out what to think about first. It's just so many things going through your mind. Which, you know, again, a lot of these symptoms we can relate to. A lot of people have trouble um, pinning down and deciding where to start with what they're thinking. I've got so many ideas in my head. That doesn't mean you're having a manic phase. That just means that sometimes you're like really enthusiastic about what you're thinking about or the situation's got you really excited and you've got to sort of settle your thoughts down. Most people who aren't in the manic phase can settle their thoughts down. And then little desire for, for sleep. This is, um, can manifest itself as just a couple of hours of sleep per night, um, just barely enough to sort of keep the body going. And otherwise, the person's ba basically going to parties and going to work and um, running around with their friends in the afternoon and just basically constantly moving and um, really not feeling like they need to sleep. Now you only have to have three of the of the symptoms in black, and so um, different people's mania can look different ways, just like different people's depression can look different ways. There's no such thing as like regular depression. I mean, people vary. There's no such thing as regular mania. People vary. Um, any combination that you only have for sure the giddy, euphoric, irritable mood, and then you have to have at least three of the others. And again, these symptoms need to last at least two weeks. The thing with bipolar disorder is you're going to alternate between a depressed phase that lasts at least two weeks and then a manic phase. And I shouldn't say it lasts at least two weeks for sure because there are people who are, are what we call rapid cyclers who will have a manic phase that lasts 12 hours and a depressed phase that lasts 12 hours. I mean, in 24 hours, you'll see them go through the full cycle. Most people with manic depression or bipolar disorder will cycle on more like a six-month phase or something like that. Um, most of the time, there's a period of normalcy that on one end has depression and on the other end of that time span, there's a, a manic phase. For some people, there's so much time between the depression and the mania that it's hard to get diagnosed correctly because the doctor doesn't really see the person cycling through. They, the person may come to see the doctor when they're depressed and then not come see the doctor when they're manic because they're so, they, a lot of times people prefer their manic phase because they're finally energetic and can get stuff done. And so they may not go see their doctor about it. So this can be a tough one to diagnose. Uh, sometimes you have uh, symptoms that can be confused with other disorders like schizophrenia also. So this one's a tough one to diagnose. Um, okay, let's go ahead and take a break here and I'll come back and talk about, um, you know, the causes and susceptibilities and things.